and everybody. We're in 1 John. We're going to start in verse 5 today. And we'll finish chapter 1. That's a chapter in two weeks. So it's only 10 verses, but. So, Father, we love your word. We honor it. We ask in the name of your son, Jesus, that you would speak to us, inspire us. Lord, with the full weight of your word, bear down upon us today and shape us. We want to be disciples of Jesus who live faithfully, who carry the gospel faithfully. So this morning, during this time, Lord, we ask that you would, you would do what only the Spirit of the Lord can do, really press our hearts, expose our, our sin, our shortcomings, and encourage us by the power of your Spirit. We trust you. Why don't you just tell them as we transition, we trust you, Lord. We trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, all God's people said amen. Amen. I thought this week about um, Augustine's confessions. St. Augustine in his 40s, around the year 400 AD, wrote um, essentially his life story, and he called it Confessions, because it was really raw and honest, which wasn't particularly common in the day for a bishop in the church just to tell his life story. And I mean, St. Augustine laid out like his sexual sin, like his um, his pride and, and being bound by uh, false philosophies. Like he really held no punches. He just bore his soul in writing. And literally people still read confessions today. So now for like 1500 years, everyone's reading about Augustine's sin. Um, and for some reason, we all seem to love him all the more for it. There's a really profound thing about, about honesty. And in St. Augustine's Confessions, um, in chapter 4 of book 1, which is really early, he, he asks this question, what art thou then, my God, or what are you, God? And um, he's really come to this place of having quite a high theology. He's He's begun to ponder the beauty, the majesty, the grandeur of God. And, and this is what he writes to kind of answer his own question. What art thou then, my God? He writes, most high and most good, most potent, no, most omnipotent, most merciful and most just, most hidden, yet most present, most beautiful, most strong, standing firm and elusive, unchangeable, and all changing, never new, never old, ever working, ever at rest, gathering in, lacking nothing, supporting, filling, sheltering, creating, nourishing, and maturing, seeking, and having all things. Then he writes this, and what have I now said, my God, my life, my holy joy? Or what says any man when he speaks of you? And woe to him who keeps silent about you, since many Babylon and say nothing. Augustine, his, without a shadow of a doubt, the greatest thinker for centuries. He's wildly brilliant. You might say like me. Um, I'm just, I'm just teasing. Just making sure you're awake. Um, and he, as he says, what are you, God? He starts to try to like grasp at words to articulate God's nature. And then he says, he's the most high and most good. Then he says, most potent or most powerful. And then he ups himself. No, not the most powerful, the, the most all-powerful. And he says, the, the most merciful, but the most just. And it's, it's like he's grabbing, trying to articulate this, this Christian theology, which says that God is so beyond our ability to express his great goodness, his holiness, his purity. And, and some of these attributes even feel contradictory at first, like most merciful and most just. It, like, how do those two things coexist? Yet every Christian would say, yes and amen, he is most merciful and most just. And then I like when he says, um, but what have I just said, God? It's like, as if he's saying, like, did I, did I limit you in my own articulation? What have I just said? But then he says, woe to anyone who doesn't try to speak or define who you are. So uh, it's, it's, it's so fascinating to to like for a minute be in the mind of the most brilliant theologian for, I don't know, roughly four or 500 years after and, and hear him trying to articulate in his heart the nature of God. And what I wanted to show you today is that having a high theology of God, like allowing yourself 
to ponder, to think, and to ascend in thought towards God's great nature, his omnipotence, his, his omniscience, the fact that you could never measure God's intelligence. Like, you can't put a grip on it. I was riding with uh, Pastor Seth in the car this week, and I don't know why, for some reason, like, I just do not care about geography at all, don't care. And he was testing my geography, and I was trying to explain to him why Wisconsin is under Washington, because Wis sounds like the West Coast, and so it must lay right under Washington. And he was trying to explain to me that Oregon sits there. And I said, don't care, doesn't matter. Um, Within our skulls, there's the ability to measure our own intelligence. You can't measure God's intelligence. It's, it's unfathomably great. And as you allow your mind to rise, to think on God and his goodness and his greatness, at some point down the line, you have to come to grits with your own nature. And so it's very fitting that at the introduction of Augustine's Confessions, he allows his mind to rise and to try to articulate the grandeur of God but the entire book is called Confessions. And it's, it's acknowledging the holy nature of God. And then at some point, as you look up and see how beautiful he is, your eyes begin to, at some point, drift into my own soul. And then I have to go, oh, no. Um, his having a high theology of God, it actually logically, I don't have the time to articulate all of this. It logically requires, at some point, you being honest, and, and articulating your own nature, your own fallenness. And that's what we're seeing in Augustine's Confessions. Holy, holy, holy are you God. And then Augustine's saying, now let me tell you about me, <laughs> my struggles, my failures. But even in the telling about me, as Augustine's caught into what John's going to call this morning, the light of God, He's shedding off his scales. He's shedding off his, his old nature. And so um, as John writes to us and he articulates his, John's lofty theology, his high grandeur of who God is articulating, John's going to say, God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. And, but it's, it's fascinating to articulate for John that God is light means to walk with him is to step into it. And I'm articulating that I believe he is total purity. In the articulation, I'm allowing myself to be exposed. To to step into right theology of God is to step into honest reflection of self. John, John says, like, God is totally pure. And everything in God is not only pure, but it's, it's visible. And so I, I know those, those are kind of strange thoughts, but I'm going to do my best to tie it together for you as we go. You guys with me so far? Let me read to you from 1 John, verse 5 through 10. And we're going to do our best to think about the theology and then to understand that John is saying the theology leads to a life of, that pursues purity and confession or visibility. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, we said the last week, that John is writing to most likely house churches in Ephesus that have now been infiltrated by false teachers who are attempting to redefine what Christianity is. And in their redefinition of what Christianity is, 
they are trying to block out or disassociate with certain Christian leaders who would challenge their false teaching. Okay, if a false teacher attempts to rise in a Christian community, at some point he has to go head to head with the other Christian leaders in the community. Does this make sense? There's a debate about to be had. And this false teacher, these false teachers are hoping to disassociate or disfellowship the, 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 the Christian leaders in the community who would in any way challenge their authority. And so John starts by trying to answer the question for us, what is a Christian? If they're attempting to disassociate or disfellowship solid godly teachers, let's make sure you know how to articulate and to define what is Christian, what Christianity is, because you can't disassociate from those who proclaim the true gospel and who live as true Christians. And so there's, there's a real um, defining of Christianity, and if you will, today we'll see a testing that John wants the church to be able to do, a discerning. And so as we read the text this morning, we keep getting these, if anyone claims that he walks in the light, if every time he says, if anyone claims, if anyone claims, if anyone claims, he's giving you a test. He's saying if someone makes this claim, if they declare this truth, then here are the consequences of said truth. If they claim to walk in the light, yet their life expresses darkness or continual sin, therefore, then they must be a liar. You see, he's teaching the church to discern. He's teaching the church to think well about people who are trying to prop themselves up as the new and rightful Christian leaders. Okay, so far? Now, let's start with, John starts with theology again, like, like Augustine. He starts with theology, and he says, um, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. Okay, we did this last week, but let's just reaffirm our thoughts here. This is the message we, being the apostles, we heard from him being Christ. So John is teaching and proclaiming now on the basis of his eyewitness account, first person testimony. He is quite literally saying, this is the message that Jesus Christ preached to me and now I proclaim to you. There's, there's no like third, fourth person passing down the line, someone had a dream, no. These are the words of Jesus, the words that fell from his lips that I heard. This is Jesus' theology of who Jesus is. God is light. This is the high theology, the lofty expression of God's nature that must be clung to, held, and cherished by anyone who claims to be a Christian. God is light. Light. He is not like the pagan gods who can be swayed or convinced. He's not like the pagan gods who have desires and lust. No, the God of Scripture is total immaculate purity. He is light. And notice, in him is no darkness. In him there is not a speckle, not an ounce, not a sliver, not a shadow, not an iota of impurity. In him there is no darkness. And the Greek is kind of fun because it... It wants to layer again. In him, there is no darkness at all. Not even a little bit. Not, e not even a speckle. Now, to be Christian, John is saying, you must confess this high theology. God is wildly holy and pure and fathomably spotless. You can never articulate or define or wrap your arms around just how clean and upright, and just, and righteous, this God is. He is light. What else does this metaphor intend to communicate? Well, it seems plain to me that it means to communicate that the light that God is not only is pure, but it will expose and eradicate any darkness that attempts to step towards its presence. Darkness cannot coexist with light. He eradicates all impurity that comes to him. So from there, we've been given our high theology that God is like wildly pure, and then there's some logical deductions or conclusions that flow from this message that John wants you to, to think about so that you would be able to discern in the future 
What does it mean to be a Christian and what types of people should you allow in your fellowship and particularly to lead your fellowship? Because again, what's being defined is who's the church? God is light. The first claim, we're given three claims. Um, if we say we have fellowship with him, if we say we have no sin, if we say, every time we're given an if we claim or if we say, he's giving us another discerning question, another mark where we should stop and ponder. If someone says or claims that they have fellowship with him while walking in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And this emphasizes, again, the truth that the light intends to eradicate darkness. You cannot live in fellowship with this wildly holy of a God and continue on in your own habitual sin. Now, he does not say you cannot um, walk in the light if you've ever struggled with lust or wrestled with deception, if if you're here and you're really trying to wrestle down a sexual sin, and this, this really becomes prevalent in our conversation concerning homosexuality. Like if you're here and you have an inclination towards homosexual sin and it's something that you've got to really wrestle with and fight with and you're struggling, the church says yes and amen, keep struggling, keep walking towards the light. You can pursue him while you are actively trying to put out the darkness in you. But the, but the logical counterpart is if you walk openly and willingly in the darkness, you're not Christian. This is just the teaching of the gospel. And Jesus is gonna keep saying like, Christians bear certain fruit. Many will say to me on the last day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons on your, in your name? And Jesus will say, away from me, I never knew you. You never walked with me. So we get a delineation right away between the, the difference, the distinction of someone who is wrestling down sin and putting off their flesh as they try to walk closer to the light and someone who chooses to live in darkness while merely confessing with their lips that they love him. You can't walk with him without allowing his holy, pure light to mess with you. Now, um, maybe I'm throwing away the whole sermon here. Let's just do it. Um, I, I'm not following my own notes, but it's your fault. Um, the, the logical conclusion that God is light means that the closer you walk with him, the more aware you become of your own sin. I, I think that sometimes the most mature believers feel like the biggest sinners, and we're all going, like, your great sin is what? That you struggled with pride this morning? Like, I don't know about it. Some of you are like, well, I'm struggling with sexual sin. I still haven't been able to put off. Um, sometimes the most mature believers will say with the apostle Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. And, and the reason that they feel such a weight of sin is because they're so near the one who is sinless. And the, the, the light is, is exposing the deepest parts of their soul that, that are still yet to be purified. And so, Walking with God, I'm just, just listen to me. I, I think this is really helpful. Walking with a God who is light is both um, wildly healing and can be wildly painful. B because around every corner, I'm forced to face off with how much I am not holy. And sometimes in a season of life where I feel like I've finally got some health and some rhythm and I feel rested and I feel okay, I feel like I can do this, then all of a sudden some circumstances happen where my flesh really acts out and I speak out of line or I gossiped when I knew I should have shut my mouth and something spewed from my soul. And it's like, God, I was doing good, but for some reason now you want to mess with me again. It's a requirement, like, like a logical deduction that walking with a God who is light is both freeing and, and painful, lovely and frustrating. And um, forgive me if you're a physician in the room. I hate doctors. I hate, 
I don't hate them. I don't want you messing with me. I know sometimes that I need to be messed with. I need, there's an affection. There's something that needs to be sewed up. There's an off imbalance. There's something that needs healing. I know that, but I still don't want you messing with me. Walking with God requires, it requires that confession. I know there are things in me that need healing. Really frustrating. Really, if we're just going to be really transparent, at times embarrassing to walk in the light and for others to see how, how gross the things in my soul are. It can be, if you struggle with pride, if you, this, this is probably why humility is the chief characteristic of a Christian. You, if you are a proud person, naturally embarrassed, you want everyone to have this perceived persona of yourself that you have everything together. Christianity's hard for you, buddy. Because walking in the light means I'm now visible. Okay, and you see my flaws and my failures. And because, gosh, I'm so like off on a ramble here, but just follow me. Because God is omniscient, it is part of my high theology that there is no limit to his knowledge of me. Numbered the hairs of my head before the words are on my lips. He knew it all together. He sees, knows the meditations of my heart. He knows me better than I know me. When your God knows you better than then you know you. There's no point in trying to hide. If you have a low theology and one of these pagan deities that can be manipulated, yeah, maybe you can continue on with your faking how great you are. But in this faith, where God is wildly omniscient, there's no such thing as deceiving him. So to walk in light means two things. I must have a pursuit of righteousness because I can't have fellowship with the one who is righteous without walking near him. I must pursue righteousness too. I must live visible. Now, I want to take just a few moments to articulate what I mean by living visible. Because um, I think maybe in our day, in the like social media age, we think of living visible or living um, authentic or transparent means that every time I struggle, I have to do a new Facebook Live or Instagram Live and tell everybody about how I had my marriage is falling apart and I'm wrestling. I don't think that's at all what it means to live visible. If your marriage is falling apart and you want to go live on Instagram, whatever, um, but for the rest of us, that's, that's not what it means to live visible. What it means to live visible is that when you sit down with brothers and sisters in the faith for dinner, people you trust, people in your church body, people who know you, you don't sit there and lie. At some point in the conversation, you say, even if it's just a, you know, the man says to the man across the table, hey, man, if you got some time, like, I could really use a coffee to talk. Um, even if it's not hashing it all out over dinner, living visible means I'm letting other people walk with me, talk back to me, see me. I'm not self-deceiving and hoping to deceive you into how awesome I am. If at no point in your Christian life you're talking with people about your own struggles, your own wrestles, the places in your soul that you're trying to conquer, I don't trust you at all. You say, Caleb, that's harsh. Well, well, that's exactly what John is teaching here. That if people do not live visible, they are not trustworthy. Spiritual leaders who prop them up, at, prop themselves up as hyper spiritual, and they've got it all together. And every day, all day, they have angelic visions and great spiritual highs. And at no point do they struggle or wrestle. I don't trust as far as I can throw. The 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 the, the, the hallelujah. The 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 visibility means I when I it doesn't it, again it 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 doesn't mean I have to stand before the whole congregation and tell everyone every foul thought that I had. But it does mean the people that are close to me in the faith know me. And when I struggle, and I've struggled, at some point I'm, I'm sitting down with an elder or a mentor, someone older in the faith, and I'm, and I'm not hiding or covering. And there's something here, there's a biblical motif or a biblical like metaphor that I'm, I'm not quite sure I have a full grip on, and forgive me because it seems slightly inappropriate, but it's just true. Um, the idea of nakedness in Scripture, um, it car- like obviously when Adam and Eve sinned, 
they all of a sudden recognize that they're naked and want to cover. Um, when you, when, when in the latter chapters of Revelation to the letters of the churches, um, Jesus will say to one church, you think that you're rich and wealthy and prosperous, but in actuality, you're poor, blind, and naked. Or uh, Hebrews chapter 4, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing, discerning between soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And then he says, um, we all will stand before him naked and exposed and give account for our lives. I stand before God who is omniscient. Um, obviously, I don't think it means naked clothing-wise. But, but in some sense, the embarrassment that I would feel, the vulnerability that I would feel naked before you today, which would be a wild embarrassment. <laughs> uh, I, dreamed, I, dream, I dreamed this week that I was preaching. And as I was preaching, I started to jump because I was really getting into it. And I was jumping and jumping. And then as I was jumping, I looked down and realized I was in my underwear. And I, and I thought to myself, this is not my summer body jumping up and down. <laughs> this is my winter body shaking around on the stage. Um, but, but you know what I'm talking about? Like that, we all have that innate fear, right? Of like being seen without clothing. I don't know why, that's a fear. Um, that, that, that type of vulnerability, like wild visibility, the scripture says, when we stand before God, he will see all and know all. And when I recognize that and I freely confess it, I, I learn to not need to lie to the people around me. So he says, if anyone says he walks in darkness or walks in light while living in darkness, he lies and doesn't practice truth. If you say you have fellowship with God while you actively pursue dark living, you are not a Christian. And, and you are, in, in the words of John, a liar. To say I'm a Christian and to live openly, freely in sin, however I want, John says that makes you a liar. And again, he's teaching us to discern because there are some people rising in the Christian church who are teaching things like Gnosticism, which say that I can be a Christian and have whatever kind of intercourse I want with anyone because my physical body is fallen anyway. And John's saying, if they're doing that, they're liars. Just put your antenna up. That's a liar. Don't, don't let them in your fellowship. Don't let them lead in your fellowship. Now, fellowship becomes a real thrust of this text because, again, he's not just talking about um, intimate relationship with God, but he's talking about fellowship with one another. And when he says, if we say we have fellowship with God, yet we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth, he then gives us a counter argument um, in verse 7 where he says, but, everybody say but, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now, this is actually really interesting because what he just argued was, if anyone says I have fellowship with God while they live in darkness, they lie and they don't practice the truth. But if they walk in light, then they have fellowship with God? No, he says that then they have fellowship with one another, which is, which is strange because he just said, if you say you have fellowship with God, but live in darkness, then you lie. But if you actually live in the light, then you have fellowship with one another. And so now what we're finding in the text of Scripture is that to live in the light, to live vis visible, is a foundation for real communion, fellowship, and church. Churches are people who are honest with each other about where they are, what they're struggling with, and where God is trying to actively purify them. Part of being a real community is confessing your sin. So let me just shoot really straight for 30 seconds. We live in a culture where everyone thinks that they need to project their best self every corner, every If you are a man in the room and you sit down to have coffee with another Christian brother and you lie about what's going on in your life, you are not doing church. You are not doing fellowship. Every elder, every small group leader, every person in the church who has tried to do discipleship, let me tell you this. People come to me for counseling, and I say this all the time. They are lying, and I can't do anything with them. 
I can work with a lot. You come to me and say, man, I'm really struggling with my marriage. I'm, I'm wrestling with insecurity. I'm struggling with drug addiction. We can work through that mess. If you sit down in front of me and lie and say, everything's great and good and you continue to deceive, just leave. Because I can't do anything with that. I cannot do anything with that kind of self-deception and trying to deceive me into thinking you're some great spiritual giant. I don't care anyway. Um, it, a, a base requirement for Christian fellowship, for Christian discipleship, for Christian community is honesty. And that base requirement is founded upon our theological confession that our God is light. If our fellowship is to be filled with the Holy Ghost, who is light, if our fellowship is to be real koinonia, real relationship that is God-infused, then there must be honesty, confession, transparency. Now, if I need to take 30 seconds to say this, that there have been times in church history, and I have seen even in my lifetime, um, churches who have taken this principle and then used it to abuse people. For instance, if you ever go to a church and they want you to sign a contract that says that you're going to you're going to submit your full finances every year for the elders to oversee. Like, I probably wouldn't go to that church. Like, if they're using the idea of transparency to mean that you have no privacy or ability to um, expose to people that I trust, they're the, they're the greatest manipulators in church history, the greatest manipulators in cults, will sometimes use this principle to say, you have to tell me everything all the time. You can't make a decision without me. You guys following what I'm saying? Or um, Elder Jerry Ward, um, as long as he's, I've known Jerry, loves to help people with finances. If you're struggling with your finances and you need some help to think through your finances, we have six kids, so we have money moving all directions. There are times where Jerry has helped us think through our finances. If you go to Jerry and say, can you help me with my finances? He would be glad to. He would love that. If an elder, and Jerry would never do this, if any of our elders ever came to you and said, give me your full financial report now, I would say, see you later, dude. Like, I don't know. I'm not submitting myself to this kind of abuse. You guys, you guys catch that? You're allowed to use a little discernment. So again, I'm not saying that if you're struggling with alcoholism, that you have to tell every single person in the room, but you need to tell some people in the room. And if other people come to you and say, man, I noticed that you're stumbling around the parking lot and beer cans are falling out of your truck. Are you doing okay? You are required to say, nah, I'm struggling. But I've had people in the church, beer cans falling out of their car saying, no, I don't got a problem with alcohol. If we say we have no sin, anyone who says we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Notice here that there are some leaders in the church who rise up and project and proclaim, I have no sin. I have arisen to the state of full maturity. Remember the Apostle Paul saying, um, I'm running my race. I'm pressing on towards the upward goal of Christ Jesus. I don't think I've achieved it yet, but I think for if the Apostle Paul has not yet achieved Christian perfection, I would just suggest that the pastor, no matter how charismatic he is, no matter how much sweat falls when he preaches, no matter how many signs and wonders and angelic visions he claims to have, and no matter how many thousands of dollars he promises you'll receive if you donate just $500 today, he's probably a liar. Okay, um, again, people that project total spiritual perfection, I don't trust. Okay, there, there is, there's got to be a sense of I'm wrestling onward. And, and for me, and it's not to say like, um, you know, the process of sanctification, at first, you guys remember when you first got saved, maybe you just got saved last week. And some of the first things that you deal with are like um, sexual sins. Maybe you got saved and you've got an alcohol problem and you're like, man, I got to fight that down. And if I could just beat this alcohol problem, then I would be holy. You know what I'm talking about? And for me, I remember like profanity and, and some of that stuff as I got saved. And I was like, for six months, a year, two years, fighting it down, fighting it down, fighting it down. And there was a point in my Christian life when I realized that I no longer struggled with the profanity or struggled with certain lustful thoughts. Um, but I felt just as gross. <laughs> because now I'm going, okay, you're not struggling with these lustful thoughts, but dude, you are arrogant. And why do you feel the need to be the center of attention? And why are you so selfish with your resources? 
And it's like every step you take towards God, the sanctification process actually gets even more painful because the things in here are deeper, more central to my personality that God is sifting. Um, and so all of the Christian life is this. And if you as a Christian leader, a Christian man or Christian woman can't articulate to a brother or sister the things where you feel like God is still moving and working, if you have to tell everyone about your prophecies and your dreams and how anointed you are, you need me to tell you where you're struggling with sin? Because I can. I can spot that. I've been duped a time or two. That one I got. Anyone who claims that they have no sin, they deceive themselves. And the truth is not in them. Don't trust, John is quite literally saying, don't trust leaders who pretend like they have no sin. And he says, the final, if we say, so people who say they have no sin, they actively have no sin, don't listen to them. And people say that they've never sinned or they've never struggled with past sin. They're liars and they make Jesus a liar. His word is not in us. His word is not in them. If we did, so, so listen, we'll use a little bit of theological language just for a second. When we come to the proper theological confession that God's holiness is so grand, his perfection is limitless, his omniscience is omni, like endless. When you come to the proper theological confession, you are forced to deduce what we call human depravity that humanity is crooked and broken and has issues. Humanity is sick. And as we confess human depravity, then we are in agreement with the teaching of Jesus that says, I've got sin that needs forgiving, and I've got things in my soul today that need cleansing and forgiving, and I'm journeying towards you, which is life. If people have the need to deny human depravity, they are not Christian if they either hide their sin or lie about their sin, don't trust them. But, but, but if I could just take a few seconds, when you read, I don't know if you've ever thought this through, but for instance, um, the gospel of Mark, we, we, we were studying Mark, you know, kind of on and off. Um, Mark, they say, was the scribe for the apostle Peter, uh, meaning Mark was Peter's secretary and was writing the gospel as Peter told it to him. If you read the gospel of Mark, you will see over and over and over again how stupid Peter is. And some of the other gospels will actually slide over certain parts. Like, like, like um, John might not articulate how great of a failure Peter made in this area because he doesn't feel the need to, but Peter always does. Okay, the Bible, start to finish, never tries to convince you that David was perfect in all his ways. Like, I probably wouldn't tell the story of Bathsheba, Right? But the Bible is wildly honest concerning the depravity of humanity, as are the apostles. So, so John, Peter, James, as they lead, they are telling their own stories, talking about their own shortcomings and failures. They lead, they lead in the light with a spirit of honesty, a spirit of transparency, a spirit of confession. James says, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. They're teaching a, a mutual confession. And then the apostles say, anyone who doesn't live that way, send them packing. Don't let them have part in the fellowship. Don't let them, certainly don't let them lead the fellowship. They say they live in the light while they actively live out unrighteousness. They're a liar. They say, I don't, never sinned before. Oh God, just leave. They say, I have no sin. I've arrived to perfection. Liar. The apostles, Peter is just like, you want to see how stupid I was here? And then you want to see something really stupid? I said, see what I did here? And then I told him, I'll never leave you. I'll never deny you. And then 30 minutes later, they were sitting here telling some girl. He actually, the language is really interesting. He's actually like using kind of profanity. Like, I don't ever know him. Peter's saying, you want to see somebody fickle? Look at that. But when Peter stands in the early chapters of Acts and he preaches the gospel under the anointing of God and under the unction and thousands of people are saved, that is the, the picture of the gospel, that you and I are broken and depraved, but as we walk with God, we are being sanctified, becoming like him, and there is a redeeming process taking place. There's, in other words, you are depraved and I'm depraved outside of this gospel, but in Jesus, 
we have hope. Now let's just stop there. I have like eight other pages of notes, but we'll stop for today. As we like ramp up in our prayer meetings, man, I'm just, I just want to say out loud, I'm so proud of our church and the participation and, and prayer. And um, man, last night was beautiful. And so I, I just want to spur you on. Christian communities pray together. That is historical Christianity. Might not be modern Christianity, but it is historical Christianity. Thank you for your participation. Man, keep leaning in. God never denies the cries of his children. In our prayer meetings and as we're ramping up towards small groups, I want to encourage us to be people who live in the light. Be people who sit before leaders, sit before people who love you, and you're just honest about what's going on. Honest about your struggles. I'm not saying that you need to like show pictures or read your diary to everyone in your small group. But at some point, man, you need to look somebody in the face and say, this is, this is where I'm struggling. This is where I'm wrestling. And James says that when we confess, there's healing. And Miss Jackie was saying this morning that, that one of the things, we do altar ministry, right? Like we believe in altar ministry. We actually like don't just believe in it. We enjoy it. We like the altar. Um, one of the reasons people are afraid to come to the altar is because they don't really want to be seen. They don't want to be seen as someone who has an issue. That's really actually funny. Like if you think that everyone's sitting in the room and we're all sitting around going, my life's perfect and great and I've never had an issue. Um, stupid is as stupid does, baby. That ain't, that ain't so smart. Um, you you want to be seen as, uh, I don't, I've never had an issue or two, you're too embarrassed to tell someone what you're, what's going on in your heart. And that embarrassment, scripturally speaking, is pride. And that pride, scripturally speaking, comes before fall, comes before destruction. And so, um, I guess as we wind down today, if you want to go ahead and stand to your feet, and Desiree, if you come for me, I, I guess I'm asking us, we've got to be willing as a church to say yes to confession of sin, to say yes to visibility, to, to, to not deceiving ourselves and attempting to deceive everyone else. Some of us need to cross the barrier. You know, if there's a line in the sand and you're living over here, hoping that no one ever sees that you're not immaculate, and I'll just say that like some of you guys grew up in homes where your parents said that you have to look immaculate and talk immaculate and you need to project perfection all the time. Um, that's also dumb. Um, so some of you might be bound in some serious need to uphold your own persona. It's anti-Christian. Um, so today, I think as a body, for those of us who, you know, if you feel this poke you or prod you at all, if there's... Maybe you're like, man, I have, I have been like unwilling to be honest with people. I wanna just open the altars and maybe let's just make a kind of a corporate confession. Uh, maybe it's corporate repentance of us just coming to the altar um, and, and saying to God, we are gonna be people of the light. We want our fellowship to be infused with the Holy Spirit who is light. And so therefore we're gonna be willing, we're gonna cross the, the line in the sand and be willing to be honest, open, real, and the scripture says that in that place of honesty and openness, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. There, the blood of Jesus washes. So the altars are open, altar team, if you wanna get in place. Man, if you wanna just kinda of say yes to the sermon today, yes, I'm gonna be honest. Yes, I'm willing to live in the light. I wanna ask you to come. Maybe kneel. If you need to confess sin to 